Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Aaron Powell. And I'm Trevor Burris. And joining us today is Lawrence Reed, president of the Foundation for Economic Education. Welcome to Free Thoughts. Hey, it's a pleasure to be with you, Aaron and Trevor. Well, I guess let's start with having you tell us just a bit about the Foundation for Economic Education, which has been around for quite a while. It's one of the granddaddies of the free market movement. Yes, it is. It was founded in 1946 by the late Leonard Reed, no relation. He spelled his name R-E-A-D, whereas mine is with two E's. But I did know him in the last seven years of his life before he passed away in 1983. He was a remarkable man, uh, born in Michigan, uh, became interested in, uh, first of all, uh, just private enterprise and general business principles early on. He was a businessman himself for a time and worked later for the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce. But he had an epiphany at one point when he was with the Los Angeles Chamber, uh, thanks to another gentleman who acquainted him with uh, uh, very principled ideas of liberty and genuinely free market. So he transitioned from a, a pro-business guy to a pro-enterprise, uh, a free market guy. And uh, over the years that uh, he ran Fee from its founding in 1946 until his death in 83, he was an amazingly prolific man, uh, a gentleman of the first order, and uh, really kept the uh, flame of liberty alive at a very dark time in the late 40s and 50s, especially when Fee was practically alone in uh, promoting these ideas of individual liberty. The distinction you just made his his shift from being pro business to pro free markets that's often a distinction that i think gets lost on a lot of people especially non libertarians non free market sorts what what is that difference uh, the difference is huge in fact uh, there are an awful lot of people who uh, have come to oppose what they think uh, free markets are or capitalism because they think that uh, these things involve businesses using their political connections to get something at other people's expense or use the political power of government to uh, uh, stick it to their competitors in some way, a kind of cronyism. I know that the term often is used crony capitalism, but I like to say if it's capitalism, it isn't cronyism. Uh, the more cronyism, cronyism that's practiced, the more it looks like some form of, uh, of socialism with uh, political power determining who gets what. So I think it's important in a generally free market, uh, there are no favors, a, a free and open field for people to compete, to start businesses, to compete with the biggest of uh, existing firms, uh, and no special favors from the government in the form of subsidies or goodies of one kind or another that uh, disadvantage anyone else in the marketplace. So in the original incarnation of fee was – the idea for an educational – has it has fee changed much in, in basic mission uh, since 1946? Is still focusing on educating young people in the ideas of economics? Was there anything very different back, back in the 50s? Uh, yeah. In those early years, uh, because fee was alone uh, for the first decade or more, uh, it spoke to almost anybody uh, of any age, any occupation. And so it was probably uh, rather difficult to market in that uh, fee never really focused on a particular demographic. And I can understand that. I, I think at the time that's what it had to do. But over the years, in part because of fee's uh, progress in, uh, in uh, spawning a lot of other groups, we've had to make some changes at fee. Now we focus uh, exclusively on young people, high school and college. And even within that demographic, we have focused more narrowly on those young people who are newcomers to ideas of liberty. If you come to us and say, I want to come to a fee seminar because, you know, I've been to Cato University. I, I've been to an IHS program. I, I've read Human Action three times. Uh, we say, wonderful. We'd be happy to connect you uh, with the next level. But you're not what we're looking for. We want to be thought of as the first start, the, the first portal into liberty ideas for young newcomers uh, to, to ideas of liberty. That's how we've changed, but our core principles have not changed one iota. Is there a difference in the way that – I mean aside from maybe the degree of knowledge that you assume on the part of the person you're talking to, is there a difference in the way that you go about teaching young people versus 
older people about these ideas? Yes, there is. Uh, the younger the audience, the more you've got to make use of, uh, of technology. I think the younger the audience, the more uh, stories are important to communicate the message. Uh, that's what young people remember. That's what they relate to. If you, for instance, uh, uh, one of our key themes is the indispensable connection between liberty and personal character. If we talked about that uh, in any kind of a preachy, condescending way, uh, you know, that we'd lose our audience. But when you're talking to young people, I think in, in discussing matters of personal character and its connection to liberty, I think the best way to do that is through story. So we've become great storytellers at FEE, and many of our programs, we're getting our principles across by talking about exemplary people uh, living and from the past uh, who have uh, uh, been advocates for liberty and, and walk the walk. I wanted to ask you about someone who, who actually I don't think we've really mentioned much on Free Thoughts before but who is very associated with Fee, uh, Henry Hazlitt. I wanted to ask you about, about him and for listeners who, who aren't familiar with him and aren't familiar with his, with his excellent book, Economics of One Lesson. Can you tell us a little about him and, and his association with Fee? Absolutely. Uh, Henry Hazlitt was a very good friend of Leonard Reed's. Uh, he was on the board of Fee for many years. Uh, when he passed away in the 1990s, he bequeathed his personal library to Fee, which we still have. Uh, he was a remarkable man and contributed uh, so much uh, to our understanding of communicating ideas of liberty and free markets to a broad lay audience. Uh, he was not a, a PhD in economics, but he had an uncanny ability to communicate ideas so that anybody could understand them and actually get excited about them. Uh, he certainly did that in his classic and best known work, Economics in One Lesson. Fee has uh, helped to keep that book alive. It remains to this day uh, available on our website and in our uh, bookstore. You can get it from other places as well, but we've made sure that it's always in print and it's one of our best sellers. But Hazlitt uh, was just a phenomenal guy. One of the most treasured things I have is uh, a correspondence letters that uh, he and I exchanged way back in the early 80s. And um, yeah, I just... It's uh, he's he's a remarkable guy. And so we're talking about communicating free markets to young people or anyone whatsoever. Uh, I'm sure you have a lot to say about the fact that we have since Adam Smith, we we seem to know a lot about how, how markets work, but it seems to be very difficult to uh, convince people that markets are a good thing. Uh, why is it difficult to convince people that markets are a good thing? Well, I've often said that you know anybody can be a socialist. Uh, all it takes is the desire to have something that belongs to somebody else and the willingness to use political power and force uh, to get it. Uh, but to be an advocate of liberty and to be a consistent one whose actions uh, follow on from uh, the principles, you've got to practice things like uh, restraint, uh, you, you can't uh, stake a claim on somebody else's uh, possessions just because you want it or have a good idea. Uh, I think liberty is the only uh, social, political, economic arrangement that requires that we live to high standards of character. I've never, in all my reading of history, uh, seen a single civilization where the people have lost their character and kept their liberty. So. It doesn't take much to be a socialist, but it does take a, a higher level of understanding and of uh, moral character, I think, uh, to live your life in the within the principles of, of, of character you, and liberty. You've got, to, you've got to keep your hands out of other people's pockets. You've got to associate with others uh, in a way that respects their lives and their property. And sometimes uh, with hum the human desire to, to be secure, uh, those things... Uh, go by the boards if we think we can grab something uh, no matter how we get it. So then what would you say to – so among young people right now, um, Bernie Sanders is quite popular um, and the Bernie Sanders supporters might respond to what you just said by saying, don't you have it backwards that – so the, the free markets, capitalism is motivated by – Acquisitiveness by greed, by you know, competition that 
grinds people down and leaves people out, whereas it's the socialism or the social democracy um, that that is based on the character of of sharing, of recognizing when you have enough and other people don't, and using the mechanisms of the state not to steal but to better the worse off, give everyone a leg up, give everyone a chance. Well, I wouldn't call it sharing if you have to do it at gunpoint. Uh, and that's what socialism ultimately reduces to. Uh, so I, I think it's important for people to understand that each of us comes into this world uh, with the right to do anything that's peaceful. And we are each obligated to respect the lives and the property and the wishes, the, the choices of other people, so long as each of us leaves uh, each other alone. Uh, but socialism uh, from uh, departs from that and assumes that if it's a really good idea, we can use the political force of government to get it. I want a society, and I think this is true of every libertarian, where people do the right thing because they want to, not because they have to. I, I think it's great that uh, kids can go to college. And I think it's great that people contribute to scholarship funds uh, to enable them to go to college. But it wouldn't occur to me as a believer in liberty to call the cops and to, uh, at gunpoint, take from people so that anyone can go to college. And that's not because I think, uh, you know, government uh, uh, or, or that the private enterprise is uh, inherently greedy or anything. I think we're, we, we all have a sense of acquisitiveness. There's nothing about socialism that does away with that. Um, it's just that under socialism, your acquisitiveness can only be satisfied by using uh, political force uh, to get what you want. Uh, whereas in free markets, if you want something, you've got to persuade, you've got to convince, you've got to produce, you've got to freely associate. You don't use the force of, uh, of, of government to get what you want. Given that you're in the uh, the free market education business, business and world, not business, life pursuit is a better way of putting it. Um, have you come to a conclusion of something that you think is the sort of the main reason people disagree with free markets? And I mean specifically with Aaron and the Bernie Sanders thing. Yeah, is it that they they don't think that the market would supply these things or do a good job of supplying health care? So they just don't. People don't know enough about the mechanisms of the market that can make these things work to have health care and education and, and charity. Um, or is there something more? rapacious in some of these people who, who really just want to take from people who have something to give it to people who don't um, because of their view of justice, maybe not rapacious but at least um, uh, more just about forcible redistribution for justice's sake. Yeah, I, I think there's something to that but there are other factors uh, at work as well. Uh, I'm trying to remember how you exactly put it at the opening of your question there. Well, well, the question of just about yeah, the question of just they don't have the belief that the market works. I mean, and so I mean, maybe the first thing we have to do is just convince them that it does because they think that they're comparing Bernie Sanders' promises to Mad Max chaos of the robber barons era or something, some sort of image they have of what markets are like that they're probably wrong about. Yeah, people often judge markets against a perfect ideal. And if you judge anything according to that, it's going to be found wanting. They don't have the same high standard when it comes to government. If they did, they'd be looking around right now and saying, holy cow, uh, we trusted it with providing education, but we've got 40, 50, 60 percent dropout rates in government schools that are graduating kids uh, claiming that they've got a 12th grade knowledge, but in fact, it may be seventh or eighth grade unprepared for the future. We've got massive government failures in so many areas, but yet people, so many people seem to think, well, that's okay. At least we mean well uh, when we do it through the government. Uh, but if they applied the same standards uh, to the private sector, they'd be horrified. So I, I think part of the problem here is we just got to get people to realize you can't judge markets against an ideal and judge government against uh, far lower standards and then end up saying, well, we just have to have more government. I mean, what if it's a massive failure? And I would argue that it has been in so many areas. So I'm curious about your thoughts on one issue in convincing people of the the value of markets and the freer the markets, the better. I mean, a lot of us around the country and all of us in D.C. are both baffled and reeling at the 
the rise of of Donald Trump um, and and his his anti immigration and his his anti free trade arguments and when I have criticized Trump on my Facebook page or elsewhere, one of the arguments that people make about why his supporters um, about why we ought to be more sympathetic to his supporters than we might otherwise be is that free trade um, brings enormous benefits overall um, and it brings enormous benefits in the long term but free trade can also hurt people who who lose out in that competition that you know you you allow people to exchange with other countries and suddenly the you know the high paying and relatively low skilled factory jobs move overseas and so now you're saying look free trade is good you know gdp is up and the country is becoming wealthy over time. And you don't have a job. Yeah, and you don't have a job. And the skills that you have are now worth a third or half as much on the the open market as they used to be. Um, so how do you go about promoting the value of economic liberty specifically to the people who have been hurt by the the, the competition that comes with economic liberty? Yeah, it is a tough issue. There's no question about it, uh, because people are interested in the here and now often more so than they are the future, and they're more interested in themselves and what immediately affects them than what might affect them uh, next year or in ten years. Part of the problem we always have in advocating for free markets is to get people to think longer term. That what strikes the eye, as Henry Hazlitt would put it, isn't necessarily the full story. So. Uh, there, there's no question we cannot deny the fact that when you allow people uh, greater freedom to trade with people elsewhere in the world, that some individuals will in the near term be hurt. But that's no different uh, than it is in any other aspect of an economy. Even when domestic competition arises, uh, one hamburger joint puts another one out of business uh, because consumers say, I'd like the, the new burger better than the old one. So these are changes I don't think you can ever get uh, completely uh, behind us. It's, it's the nature of a dynamic economy that's based on uh, the right of individuals to freely choose with whom they want to do business. So, yeah, I, I – It might not convince everyone, but it's a, it's, a, it's a one way of doing it, I guess. That's right. And if you get people to realize, hey, it, it may be uncomfortable to have free trade for some people, but it's even more uncomfortable – and probably for a lot more people, if you try to freeze the market in place, close the door to things like uh, competition from overseas, new options, slower prices, uh, more choices, and so forth, uh, in the long run, that does benefit everybody better. And no one has the right to use the political force of government uh, to feather their own nest or to keep the, the job that they presently have. If it, uh, you have a right to convince people, hey, buy for me instead of that guy. But you have no right in a free society to use the force of government to compel somebody to buy from you or to hire you uh, instead of whoever they may choose otherwise to deal with. Now you've been you've been doing this for a while. If you found uh, sort of methods of communication to talk about free markets that a you think are particularly useful and good. I mean, you mentioned stories is a really good way of doing it. Um, but if you sidle up to someone at a bar and you just sort of start talking, you know, what's the first kind of thing you say to them? And then the second part of the question is, do you have any particular pet peeves about the way that some people might talk about markets that you think are counterproductive and, and not really helping the situation? Sure. Uh, I do have thoughts on on these issues. And in many cases, they were prompted originally by my uh, reading of our founder's work, Leonard Reed, he had a uniquely special way of communicating to people. He was always uh, uh, calm. He was always uh, uh, gentle. Uh, he never came across as, hey, what's wrong with you? Uh, I got to beat this into your head until you get it. Uh, and he, he strongly believed that if you are uh, a humble person, and your humility shows in, in the sense that you communicate to people that you you don't think you know everything, that you're willing to listen, then certain barriers come down right away. 
but also, I think another important tip is uh, be patient with people. Sometimes uh, you see someone advocating for liberty who who is just so impatient to get you to come aboard 100% on everything as quickly as possible. Uh, sometimes it, it works better just to uh, convince people of a few points here and there and be very encouraging to them as they rethink their premises. Let it take a little time, uh, and ultimately you're going to have a, a greater chance of a uh, guaranteed convert than if you try to beat them over the head with everything all at once. So I want to go back to this project that you talked about on exploring the relationship between liberty and character. I had recently read your your essay on this topic and I was struck by the line that, that you mentioned earlier about um, how free markets and liberty um, is, is the system that demands of us high character and is, is unique in that regard. Um, and I was wondering how that fits with the you – know, there's this, this other defense of a system of ordered liberty and a system particularly of free markets and of capitalism that says you know, one of the really neat things about this is that it works even if people are of – let's call it lower moral character or in particular are, are greedy um, because it channels that. It, it, turns, it turns what look like vices into productive virtues in a way that other systems don't. So is, that, is there a conflict there between the system requiring moral virtue and then this argument that it, it seems to make productive vice? Uh, no, I don't see a conflict at all. I think you can come at it from from both angles, and in, in my mind, sometimes it's a you know uh, which came first, chicken or the egg uh, issue. But I think the two things together are uh, work powerfully together. That before uh, a society can become free, I think people have to understand such things as respecting the lives and the property of other people. I don't think a society that uh, of, of thieves will likely emerge into a society of freedom. So if, at some point you've got to raise your character and recognize that uh, there are others in society and they deserve just as much respect from you as you would expect from them. Uh, but then I, I also uh, agree with the argument you've raised that free markets have uh, 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 among its many benefits, a free market has uh, the benefit of encouraging progress. So every time I go into, say, uh, Walmart or any store for that matter, I'm greeted by people who would otherwise have no reason to ever say hello to me or what can I do for you or how can I help you. But the very fact that they're part of an operation that is designed to uh, curry favor with me and get my patronage uh, means that they've raised their standards. So I think it works in both directions. Uh, but what I'm most convinced of is that a people who abandon strong elements of personal character, who become largely dishonest or impatient or timid or irresponsible, I think in, it's only a matter of time before whatever freedoms they've got uh, will be lost. Some people might listen to you, you say character and think that you sound um, – Antiquated is the, is the word I want to – that the, the discussion of character is, belongs in a different era. It's the kind of thing that Leave it to Beaver talked about and you know, he sits down Wally and the Beave and he tells them about these, these things and we don't really do that anymore. It all seems kind of quaint to talk about character with such earnestness. Um, so two, two questions like if, if you agree with that that's kind of changed, why do you think that has changed and, and is, that a, is it a valid critique to say that character has kind of – it's kind of passe and we need a new way of talking about markets? Well, you can certainly advance ideas of character or at least pretend to advance them uh, in ineffective ways like wrapping yourself in uh, the stories or analogies uh, uh, that seem like yesteryear to a lot of people. But I think it's more important to stress today that uh, uh, it, it, how many people out there really don't want to live in a society where people deal with each other honestly? Would anybody really, if, upon reflection, want to live in a society where everybody's lying to you all the time, stealing from you, 
uh, or in other ways are irresponsible or uh, impatient with you. I mean, these are timeless values. And uh, yeah, it's true that times have changed and our heroes are not the same that they once were. But the timeless values underneath strong character, I think, are just as valid as ever. Most people, overwhelmingly, most people want to live in a society where they are respected, where others deal with them in an honest fashion. So I don't see these core character values as being in any way outdated. It's just how we sell them that can can be seen as outdated. Now, that's kind of interesting because, uh, I mean, people might be – thinking about character less. And we do have, again, I, to bring up Donald Trump again, which, I mean, it's important to talk about it because it's a crazy phenomenon. Post-character post, candidate. It's a, he's yeah. a post-character candidate, I yes. Think, right. <laughs> Does that mean that maybe people aren't drawn to good character anymore? They just they want someone who's a clown and funny and says whatever pops into his mind? Well, I think what's motivating uh, the sympathy for Trump is uh, – and I admit it's, it's far greater than I would have anticipated, and in that sense, it's been a disappointment to me. But I think what motivates it is a, a, a justifiable anger with the way government has been operating in recent decades. Uh, I just think Donald Trump is a very poor vessel into which uh, to, to pour that anger. But I'm sympathetic with. I mean, people have darn good reason to to feel disdain for so many in both parties who have let them down so many times. But I'm afraid if they glom on to Donald Trump that they're setting themselves up for uh, just as much of a disappointment at, uh, at some point uh, as they've ever had before. Do you think there's anything about government or big government in general that, that you can kind of expect disappointment or it will, it, will, it will breed the kind of disappointment with Washington that maybe Bernie Sanders and Trump are both a part of because government promises a lot and can't deliver much and when we centralize things in Washington, it, it creates difficult situations where everyone feels like they're not being represented. Maybe it's just part of the growth of government. It, it just makes people disappointed. Oh, absolutely. I've, I've written on this in a number of places. If, if anyone thinks that they can have both good government and big government at the same time, I think they're sadly mistaken. The bigger government gets, the more it uh, claims a share of what other people have produced, the more it's in the business of, of pleasing constituencies by throwing other people's money at them, uh, buying votes with public money and so forth. The more you concentrate power uh, in Washington or any place else, uh, the more you get nastiness, the more you get people falling over themselves to get in charge of this massive redistributive apparatus, and they'll do anything in many cases to get a hold of that massive amount of power and wealth, uh, either to uh, enjoy it personally or to keep it at bay. And what happens is, increasingly, the bigger government gets, uh, the more the truly good people of solid character look at it and say, why would I want uh, to drag myself uh, through the mud? Uh, forget that business. I'm going to I'm going to do something else. So you end up getting the the worst people in uh, uh, in, in big government. So you got the worst of both worlds. You got a big powerful government with the worst people running it. Uh, that's why I think it's a critical point that uh, people understand that the bigger it gets, the more corrupt, the nastier it's going to be, and the more of a magnet it's going to be for the worst among us. Well, I've heard this different story though where. I mean the, the story that I know is that before the government came along to save us from many things uh, such as food and drug regulation in the progressive era or how the government needed to help us out in the New Deal, that the, the real chaos helping out unions, workers, minimum wage laws, the real chaos that existed is not a product of, of government. It just seems that as we've progressed as a society, we have seen – it has moved with bigger government. I mean, we're richer and we're, we're living longer lives now. We probably have higher happiness quotients than people in 1850, and and we have a much larger government. So it can't be that bad. It seems like the story is actually that progress is synonymous with the growth in government. Government. Well, it, it's constantly amazing to me how uh, free, relatively free people and relatively free markets continue to overcome some of the worst mistakes and follies uh, promoted by government. But in your question, you rattled off quite a string of uh, uh, what I like to call bumper stickers of the status left. 
And each and every one of them. What a coincidence I did that. (laughs) Yeah, really. (laughs) I had no plans whatsoever. No, but bumper stickers, I like that. Bumper stickers of the status left. So so what are some of those? (laughs) Well, one of them uh, you uh, mentioned was that the New Deal saved us. And, you know, if people buy into this stuff, uh, yeah, they're going to be led ultimately to the wrong conclusions and to embrace the wrong ideas. But just take that one uh, about uh, the Great Depression and the New Deal. so many Americans have been taught the bumper sticker that capitalism failed us, free markets failed us in the late 1920s, and government had to come in and rescue us. But you look at that more closely, as one of the chapters does in my recent book, Excuse Me, Professor, you'll find that at the core of that crisis was mismanagement uh, of the economy and lousy policies from government. You had the Federal Reserve, a creature of, of the federal government, uh, uh, causing an unsustainable bubble in the 1920s with historically easy money, dirt cheap interest rates, just like we had before 2008. You had a boom in the stock market because of it. And then later when the Fed reversed itself and jacked up interest rates dramatically, it, uh, it, it pricked the bubble and uh, the, the depression began. And then uh, Congress made it even worse and two different administrations, Republican and Democrat uh, successively, exacerbated it with a string of crazy policies. You had Herbert Hoover signing the Smoot-Hawley Tariff in 1930 that virtually closed the borders to international trade. If you if you were in a business that depended upon uh, trade overseas, you got flattened by Smoot-Hawley. And then in 1932, in the face of the Depression, the income tax was doubled. The top rate more than doubled. And then that's, this is even before Franklin Roosevelt. But when he comes in, with the New Deal, he ends up prolonging the Depression by at least seven years. Uh, So uh, there's a lot more to all all of that. But uh, we are constantly, those of us who advocate free markets, barraged by these status bumper stickers that uh, that say, you know, very casually, oh, the free market caused uh, the Depression, government's the answer, when in fact uh, a detailed scholarly analysis proves just the opposite. Do you do you think that this is an interesting part where I think fee fits in because we feel like we've we in the broad free market uh, tradition thinkers since in the 20th century in America um, we feel like our story hasn't been told I, I feel like in a very big way in and that's why we started things like fee and then later Cato or IHS or because the professors just weren't teaching it and the media wasn't talking about it is there is there I mean, that's the way it's often discussed. I mean, do you think that's true? And I mean, how does fee sort of fit into that narrative? I almost never run into anybody who's hostile to the free market because they've thoroughly read our side uh, and they know the literature. They've read Hayek, Mises, Friedman, and so forth, uh, and have simply come to the conclusion that it's uh, false. Uh, I, the the what I run into almost all the time are people who think they know what free markets are who know the bumper stickers that criticize it, but know nothing of the, of the literature uh, or the rebuttal to status myths uh, that, uh, that we are trying at fee to constantly uh, uh, propagate, to put in front of people. So I think what we're fighting is not uh, uh, you know, a scholarly, reasoned, and deep-seated, fundamental understanding of the economy that just happens to be different from ours. I think what we're fighting is widespread ignorance and, False assumptions that need to be corrected. So I, I like your project of as a way of addressing that because it is. I mean, when you you're trying to give these, like, get people to accept these ideas. One of the problems with free market economics, as it's often presented, is it's it's and, and arguments for liberty as well is that it's often very abstract. Um, economics, unfortunately, becomes awfully mathematical. Um, that, that those are difficult things to inspire people with. Like you want to get the people to read the literature, but most people, unless you are really hardcore, are not going to pick up Human Action and read it. Um, you you have to be quite inspired to do that. And so this this way of going about it through storytelling. So one of the things that you you do at Fee is write this this series called Real Heroes about men and women who have lived these values and contributed to this tradition. Um, are, there, are there people who are 
particularly inspiring or have particularly good and valuable stories for promoting these ideas? Oh, absolutely. I, I've been writing this series now every Friday uh, on our website, fee.org, for about a year. So I've come up with uh, almost 50 of them already, and there's so many more. Uh, you take uh, Ludwig Erhard, for instance, a name that I remember hearing as a uh, child growing up in the 50s and 60s, but whose name is largely forgotten today. Here's a guy who, after World War II, uh, became uh, an important figure in Germany, ultimately chancellor. He was an architect of fixing the post-war uh, German economy. Just imagine what he inherited. The place was a mess, uh, defeated, devastated, occupied, uh, refugees pouring in. Uh, I mean, the, the Germany was a complete socialist mess after the war, after 12 years of national socialism under Hitler. But it, within a decade, uh, it would become the richest country in Europe again, largely because of Ludwig Erhard. Uh, he, uh, there was a Sunday when he announced to the German people he was going to abolish all price controls and rationing and rely upon free markets uh, for the distribution of goods. He, he was going to um, employ a sound currency and replace the hyperinflated one. Uh, he followed market principles in a no time at all. Uh, the, the free markets saved Germany. Uh, there are lots of people like that in history that uh, students are not hearing from in, in typically in the government schools. In, in writing your series on, on these heroes, um, these interesting characters, did you have one that, that was the most surprising that you sort of discovered? I mean maybe, maybe we, we just heard about it, but is there someone who you said, wow, I've never heard of this guy and this is quite amazing? Yeah, absolutely. Quite a number of such occasions. But most recently, one that really grabbed me, I'm happy to say I met this man's son just uh, a few weeks ago in, in Poland. It concerns a gentleman I'd never heard of until last fall. Uh, his name was Witold Pilecki, P-I-L-E-C-K-I. -E he's got a rank as one of the bravest uh, people in the history of the world. Uh, he not only fought to secure Poland's independence uh, after World War I, when it emerged for the first time in over 100 years as a country again, uh, he later, when the, the Nazis invaded Poland in 1939, and two weeks later the Soviets invaded from the other direction, he joined the resistance against both the Nazis and the Soviets, became a leading uh, commander in that resistance. And after a year of fighting, uh, with word that there was this place called Auschwitz in southern Poland where uh, dastardly things may be happening, he volunteered to get himself arrested in the hopes he might be sent to Auschwitz so he could report from the inside. He had no guarantee that he would, in fact, uh, be sent there. He could have been shot on, on the spot, but he got his wish. He was sentenced to Auschwitz, where for two and a half years he, he organized a, a resistance, and his reports, the documents he smuggled out, the transmissions that he was able to do from a, from a makeshift radio for a time, became the first comprehensive eyewitness accounts of the Holocaust in the Auschwitz concentration camp. But his story didn't end there. I thought if nothing else had happened, but he spent those two and a half years in Auschwitz, he'd be a hero. But he did uh, something that only 143 other people have ever or ever did, and that was to escape from Auschwitz. He made his way back uh, 200 miles to Warsaw, where he became a leading commander in the Polish uh, uprising, the Warsaw Uprising. He was captured again by the Germans. They didn't put two and two together and realize he was the same guy that formed the resistance within Auschwitz. He spent the last months of the war in a German prisoner of war camp. And finally, uh, when the camp was liberated in May of 45, he had about four months of freedom. The Polish army had him in, Pol in uh, Italy for a time. And then when it was apparent that the Soviets weren't going to leave Poland, they needed somebody to infiltrate back into Poland, go underground, and report on Soviet atrocities. And so they sent Witold Pilecki. And for two and a half years, uh, undercover in Poland, he's now uh, reporting on Soviet activity and atrocities until he was finally uh, arrested and tortured, put on a, a public show trial, and executed in 1948 at the age of 47. Well, th the reason that that's important is or his story is important, is I think that courage is one of those indispensable character traits of liberty. 
uh, I don't see how a timid people will long keep their liberty because they're just the world is just full of people who would be happy to take your liberty from you uh, if you give them the chance. And Pilecki put everything on the line for the liberty of his people, and uh, that was a you know, I did not know about him before. And now, I'm someone happy to say that in March of this year, just earlier this very month. I spent an hour with his son, who's now 85 and uh, still keeping alive the legacy of his father. So when we look at figures uh, uh, like uh, – how do you say his name again? Uh, uh, Pilecki. Pilecki um, and say that, OK, we're going to talk about him on the fee website as you've written about him. Is it unfair to have libertarians take – "Quote unquote ownership of people who probably were not libertarian in themselves. I mean, they're just if, if someone doesn't want to be oppressed, like that's most people. But it, it, but they're not libertarian heroes per se. They just they just don't like to be oppressed. Is that is that fair to to take ownership of them? Well, I don't think we should ever claim something of of another person that that isn't true. And in my story about Pilecki, I didn't. Uh, talk at all about what his views may have been on issues like the role of government or free trade. I mean, who knows? Uh, that just wasn't what he was known for. But he certainly uh, exemplified one of the key character traits that are uh, that is essential to preserving liberty. So I'm careful not to read too much into these stories. But when somebody stands out in one way or another, irrespective of where he may have been on other things, uh, I think it's often those are stories that need to be told. Now, when you look around and you see what where Fee has gone and what Fee is doing now, and then you also look at the world and see Donald Trump and other things going on, um, do you feel optimistic about what we've accomplished? Well, first of all, do you, do you what we've accomplished? What, how do you feel? How much do you feel that we? And particularly fee too, but in the broad free market sense, have accomplished. And then going forward, do you feel optimistic about being able to accomplish more? Well, I'm very proud of the movement for liberty. Of course, I wish that we had had more victories under our belts uh, than we have. And arguably, uh, in many respects, the trends are not moving in the right direction at the moment. But I'm a, I'm a long-term optimist, and I try not to let events of the moment ever get me down. You have to be an optimist. I've often said to audiences, if, if you're not an optimist, if you're a pessimist, you've got to ask yourself, what's the point of pessimism? You don't know the future. Uh, at least we ought to have reason to believe it can be better if we work toward that end. But if you're pessimistic, you're not going to work very hard for what you know to be right, and you're probably not going to be very effective at convincing others to join your cause. So I think optimism is an important motivator for all of us. Nobody knows the future, but I do know this. If those of us who believe in liberty decide uh, the cause is lost, what's the use, let's just go back home and do something else, then, uh, then I, I would be very pessimistic about liberty. Then liberty probably would not win the future. But uh, there are so many people today uh, who weren't around doing these wonderful things for liberty 10 or 20 or 30 years ago, uh, planting seeds that will sprout in due time. I'm very optimistic for the future. I, I just don't let pessimism ever get me down. Thank you for listening. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.